you can you, you can start by saying that if you want. Okay, yeah. already. He, I, I'm being directed by Joseph McBride. It, it's an honor. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, okay. So, hello. How are you, Joe? Hi. Good to talk to you. Same here. I'm so pleased. You know, I think I started the John Ford book a while ago. I had to put it down. It, you know, so it's a, on some level, it's a very, of course, uh, intimidating this, because it's such an enormous tome. Then I went, I got all caught up with Other Side of the Wind, and I discovered you, and I knew about you as an author. But then I went back to the to the book, John, and I said, oh, my God, this is you. I, I, I just put it, it all made connections in my head finally. So that's when I said, let me look this guy up and see if I can invite you on. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's great to, it's great to draw those connections, uh, yeah, certain great directors who I've been studying for a long time. I mean, Wells thought Ford was the greatest director of all, too, you know, for example. So these things tie together in certain ways. Yeah, and, and you are part of a group of folks who just have a profound love and respect for those particular directors, John Ford, Howard Hawks, Orson Welles, Hitchcock, of course, and not to leave out Ernst Lubitsch, who I want to talk at length with you later on, but this is the new book. It came out in June of 2018, and I'm glad we're finally getting around to talk about it because it's very much available anywhere books are sold. It's called How Did Lubitsch Do It? We've heard of this something called the Lubitsch Touch, and, and this book explains right. it at a great great length about what that was that made him so unique and um, and why so many like so many of his peers really looked looked to him, didn't they? Yeah, uh, David Niven, who <clears throat> excuse me, was one of his actors, and I, I got to know David Niven, who was a great wit, uh, good good writer too. He called him the master's master, which I think is a nice description because almost all the directors of that generation looked up to Lubitsch as the best or one of the best, and um, you can go down the list of um, Ford, uh, Capra. Uh, Renoir, um, you know, uh, just all all the top directors back then, Hawks, et cetera, mm-hmm. they imitated him and they they learned from him. He was um, Ford made a great comment that he said something to the effect that we all thought we were just making entertainment. Lubitsch was the only one of us who, who realized we were, we were making art, which is quite a compliment. Mm. And, and um, I think Ford, you know, knew he was making art too, but. Uh, it was a tribute to Lubitsch's great craftsmanship and artistry. It was so uh, beautiful. They all aspired to it. And his originality, Wells mentioned that. Um, he said he was, uh, there's a wonderful quote from Wells. But Wells said uh, Lubitsch was a giant. He said Lubitsch's talent and originality are stupefying. And Jean Renoir said that Lubitsch invented the modern Hollywood quite Quite remarkable tributes, and uh, uh, you know, Wells talking talking about his originality. I think uh, hit on something that uh, you know. I tried, as you said, to define the Lubitsch touch in this book, that's more than five hundred pages long, and that shows you how difficult it is to define it because it's an evanescent term, or another word that Andrew Saris used about Lubitsch's style was ineffable. And um, when I was talking to Jim Naramore, uh, a good scholar, he and I were talking about Lubitsch a few years ago, and he said, "Well." It's really hard to write about him because he's ineffable, isn't he? And I thought about that a lot. And, you know, it's hard to put your finger on the style, but that's part of what the point of the style is. It's it's a subtlety, and it's uh, it's not something that's obvious uh, by definition. It's avoiding the cliché, as Truffaut put it, another great admirer of Lubitsch. Uh, he said Lubitsch would do anything possible to avoid the cliché. And he would rack his brain. He said he bled himself white and died 20 years too early because he was racking his brain to think of ways to tell stories in an original way. And he would say to, Lubitsch would say to his favorite screenwriter, Samson Rafelson, um, in his German accent, he'd say, how did he do it without, but how did he say this without saying that? You know, In other words, uh, let, let's get a point across, but not do it the obvious way. And they, they would um, always look for a different angle, different approach, a different oblique method oblique is obliqueness is, is the key to his method um they would show people reacting to something instead of showing the thing actually happening part of it was the response to censorship because in those days there were certain things you could not show but being a subtle guy he wouldn't have wanted to show people rolling around in bed anyway i mean that's not all that dramatically interesting so what's more interesting is what goes on in your, your mind when 
when you shoot a closed door, door shots were a big part of his style, and it makes you think and makes you participate in, in the film. And uh, makes the audience lean in as they pull off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you described him as like, or actually, I guess you were paraphrasing one of the great directors about calling him uh, the first great modern director. Was that Wells? Mm, that, is that... I don't remember that quote exactly, but. Uh, Renoir said he invented Renoir. the modern Hollywood. Okay. I was that because of the se- the undertone, the sexual undertone often, or he tried to, as you said, he cleverly conceal it, I guess, you know, and, and, and make it very difficult for the censors to uh, know what to do, right? Yeah, they, one they, of the censors said, I, I think this is kind of a key to Lubitsch's art, he said, we know what he's saying, but we don't know how he's saying <laughs> yeah, it, I love so we that. can't cut it. <laughs> and that was part <laughs> yeah. of the reason he did it that way, so he couldn't cut, although he did have a few run-ins with censors, but uh, they, they actually, you know, they were smart enough to admire his cunning and cleverness in getting around censorship, And uh, but he got away with some pretty remarkable things. De- Design for Living is a kind of a mind-blowing film today. It's about a menage a trois, and it's very obvious that, mm-hmm. you know, three people are together, and at the end of the film, they're all together in one shot, and riding off into the night together, and uh, it makes no bones about it, and uh, Molly Haskell said it that kind of demolishes every uh, uh, canon of respectability, uh, even bohemian respectability. And so he was, um, he, he would he would do clever things that would, would play games with the censors, and the audience was complicit in this. They kind of knew the rules. Mm-hmm. And, okay, let's see how much you can say without hitting people over the head with it. And, um, for example, the opening of Trouble in Paradise, which is my favorite movie show, I think it's the perfect romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. He and Rafelson spent three days trying to think of the opening, and it's a romantic film taking place in Venice, and so the cliche is to start with a beautiful shot of the Grand Canal and gondola going through the canal. Instead, he started with a um, garbage can and a dog, and it looks very grubby. It could be anywhere. And then the heavy set garbage man comes in and lifts out the can and uh, then he walks the camera pans over to the canal and you you see the canal then and he dumps the garbage into a gondola a garbage gondola (laughs) and then you see the whole canal a long shot with a beautiful light you know it's not the usual uh, way of starting with the long shot and going you know it's starting with the detail then gradually revealing the setting I notice he does that a lot in different ways if he's uh if a film takes place in a castle, he doesn't usually start the film with a long shot of the castle and move in like most directors do. He will start with some detail or, or some other scene and then gradually show you the surroundings. And uh, But that was more fun and more clever. And and it makes a point because he's undercutting romance and sort of looking conventional ideas of romance and trouble in paradise. And, and um, by showing garbage... Uh, and then he cuts back to it at a certain point in the middle of a love scene. He cuts, cuts back to the garbage gondola going down the canal. With the, and the, the canal, the, the, the garbage man is singing, oh, solo mio, you know. Right. <laughs> which is kind of a cliche, but it means, oh, oh my sunshine, which is ironic because it's at night. So it's a, really clever, but it took him three days to think of that opening. Which, you know, we don't really, we take sort of for granted, but at the time especially, nobody knew how to wrap their mind around that. That was just... Yeah, he, confusing and yet compelling, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, he was for he was groundbreaking. I think what Renoir had in mind partly was, um, <laughs> excuse me, that uh, when Lubitsch came to America in 1922 from Germany, where he was uh, the leading director in Germany, he's probably the only director who's been the leading director in two different countries. Right. Um, American films were still pretty Victorian. Um, it was the early uh, D.W. Griffith was still going strong, and he was the mm-hmm. great director of the early period and he had a Victorian sensibility about sexuality uh, among other things and Lubitsch comes along with a very cosmopolitan European viewpoint and treated sex in a much more adult fashion and that's partly why they brought him to Hollywood he had made Madame du Barry about the French Revolution which is a very racy film and uh, Hollywood thought oh the guy can make a, a big epic you know, spectacle, but with a kind of a modern sexual sensibility. And, you know, after World War One, when people were disillusioned by the war and everything was changing and women were getting liberated and getting to vote and um, people, people's sex 
Bill Maury's were loosening up and their attitudes were loosening. And Lubitsch came along right at that point and he showed Hollywood the way of how to deal with sex in an adult way and it, be funny about it. What, it was the he was living in Berlin, right? Uh, what, that's where he was based in Germany. Yeah, and he, he was, was that during Weimar, Weimar Germany. Was it Weimar Germany? Yeah, the Weimar period after yeah, so. World War One. Uh, Rich went till Hitler took over in thirty three. But Lubitsch, as Billy Wilder, who was one of his top acolytes, said, uh, he kind of joked a dark joke. He said uh, he was one of the talented ones who was brought over instead of having to flee, like Wilder himself had to flee. Right. Many, many, Hundreds of people came over as refugees and enriched Hollywood with their talents. But Lubitsch was uh, at the forefront because they brought him over and uh, they were trying to, as Hollywood often does, you know, buy off uh, uh, another film industry. And to kind of, they brought Murnau over soon after that and Fritz Lang came over. And, but Lubitsch had the longest and most successful career of the German imports. That's ironic considering he died in his mid-50s in 1947. 47, yeah. yeah. Quite a long time ago, and before, you know, before, uh, one reason he was sort of neglected, and, it, you know, that's one reason I wrote the book was, uh, you know, he wasn't around to give interviews like a lot of the old directors were, and when I came to Hollywood in the 70s, I made it my business to interview everybody I admired, and that's most amazing. of them were around, you know. I was going to say, this is a, maybe your first, Hot. this is maybe your first biography that where you didn't meet your subject, is that? Is that um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Of the three that I've done, for. Spielberg and Capra, I met them. Spielberg, I met only twice, um, but I met him when he was 27. Uh, they were doing a um, mm -hmm. uh, press thing in the commissary at Universal for Jaws, and uh, I spent an hour sitting at a table listening to him talk with some other journalists about Jaws. It was a round table, and yeah. So I got to meet him. Yeah, it was, it was less formal than they do now. It was just kind of uh, casual, but and then I met him briefly at a party once and uh, talked to him, but he wouldn't give me an interview because he um, he says he's saving it for his autobiography. But in, in other ways, he was actually helpful because he encouraged other people to talk to me. People would call his office okay. and say, should I talk to McBride? And, and I would, they were told I was kosher, which I thought was nice. You know? <laughs> the only person he said, he told his mother not to talk to me, and she, she was very nice, uh, and oh. she was very apologetic. And I said, who told you not to talk to me? And she said, the gods. <laughs> and obviously, Stephen, but, you know, your mother knows all the really bad stories about you, you know, what's under your bed, and he had a parent yeah, who fly she's... around his bedroom and take, take dumps on the bedroom and stuff, and, you know. Yeah, but in most cases, the mom is also the most fiercely protective of their son, especially the Jewish mothers. I had one, and she was... <laughs> well, she, she um, I'm sure she was, well, she was a character because she was yeah, very free in her... Uh, talk. She she became a sort of a celebrity uh, yeah. because of him, and she would be on talk shows. I saw her on The Tonight Show once uh, making jokes with Johnny Carson. She had a great personality, and so there were a lot of interviews with uh, Leah Spielberg, so I was able to quote from them, which was fine. And the person who had not been interviewed much was his father. Actually, I wasn't aware of any interviews with his father, so I got to meet him. Oh. Um, yeah. I guess before Stephen knew that I was talking to him, I, I just contacted him and he said, sure, and we had a great interview. He was really, he's a very interesting guy. He's still alive. He's 102. He's still alive. Yeah, he's still, Mrs. Spielberg died a little while ago, but Arnold is still around and, and still in good shape. That's amazing. I didn't realize that. I know, I think he so was in, was he was in, uh, talk to the father of the guy. I think he was in the, uh, was he in that recent documentary? Well, there the was recent one, Spielberg uh, was documentary, documentary recently, for, but I don't remember. On American Masters. In there, but yeah. He was on a TV show with the, he and his wife were on talking about their marriage and revealing some things about their marriage with uh, to Stephen. And uh, pretty much I had that story already in my book. I got it from other sources, but he kind of misunderstood the circumstances of his parents' divorce, which marked him, of course. We see that throughout his films. Sure, uh, especially the early ones. But he, he, he kind of blamed his father and... Uh, unfairly and I, and I brought that point out and his father was an amateur filmmaker before Stephen came along and Stephen kind of took over the family hobby and his father worked with them and so he, he you know I think through the book and other things he, he came to appreciate his father more which I feel good about well that's great that you could contribute something like that it's very rewarding I imagine right you know? yeah it was a good feeling and I, I'd heard that from a lot of people that Mr. Spielberg was uh, a great guy and he was uh, you know like one of the kids I interviewed all the kids who, who were in Stephen's amateur film.
films which nobody had ever written about. It's a great story. And the guy said, uh, well, you know, I really didn't know who was directing Mr. Spielberg or Steven. You know, I could never really tell. So it was kind of a father-son hobby for a while until oh. Steven became the dominant figure, which was interesting. Are you talking about, like, Amblin days? This is before that. Amblin, he had been directing for 11 years before that. He was 21 when he made Amblin. He oh. started when he was 10. And Billy Wilder had a great line. He said, Steven Spielberg was a great director when he was 10 years old. And he actually was. Kind of, you know. so you could see him, uh, a vision, a, you could see an, an early vision, in other words, maybe, that was very, yeah. very rare for a kid, let alone a young filmmaker. Well, just the, in the technical experimentation and all the okay. different styles and genres he tried. And uh, like one of the kids uh, showed up at, the, they were told to go to the local airport that Stephen was shooting a film. And, and uh, he was just amazed that Stephen had somehow procured a, an airliner to be in his film. And they were filming on the runway. And another time he said, we went out to shoot a war movie uh, in the mountains. And uh, Stephen came along in his mother's Jeep with a, with a machine gun the real machine gun, and he said everybody else was saying, geez, he has a Jeep, and I, I thought, well, this kid has a machine gun. Where did this kid get this machine gun? You know? did, that, I mean, was, did that come up in 1941? Where was it? Uh, well, no, not really. Uh, the, I can't remember. I thought that sounds very familiar, and like that, that scenario or version of that popped up in one well, of Well, there's that film, what's it called, Super H, I believe, that he produced that some other filmmakers that there was kind of a takeoff on oh, the yeah. young filmmakers. It, it, it kind of was a homage to Stephen, I think, oh, yeah. the young filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. definitely was. But yeah. I just remember, in, I, I thought there was a scene where, is it 1941 is the one about the town? One of his early movies, it's comedy, but it's about this whole town that's getting ready for an attack, and uh, an American town. And they, they, I think they think that there's like the wars coming to America or something like that. Well, it's set in Los Angeles, so it's making fun of Los Angeles, and it's based very, okay. very loosely on a real uh, event where they thought there was a Japanese attack taking place, but it was That's just, what it just was. A, a bunch of, um, of false alarm and uh, some air, anti-aircraft guns went off, and okay. actually five people died, partly because of this incident. Um, and the Japanese actually shelled a uh, pier in Santa Barbara, a Japanese submarine, lobbed a couple of shells and destroyed a pier. That's as close as they got to the American mainland. But it caused this hysteria in Los Angeles. It's too bad. You know, the real story is better than the fanciful <laughs> stuff that yeah. they did. 1941 is kind of a huge mess and disaster, but very interestingly filmed. But um, they leave out so much that's important and they, they throw in things that are absurd. But... Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember if there's anything specifically about the kids going around with machine guns. But, but, uh, <laughs> I, I could uh, just be inventing that, so we can disregard it. But it sounds uh, like a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might remake it and, and add that. I don't know. It's it, it's a genius. That could be funny. Go ahead and say you're going to remake 1941. See what they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that of all of his films. So you obviously got to know. Sp- well, at least when making you met Spielberg, you met John Ford, which we're going to come back to, of course. And and by the way, Ernst Lubitsch left such a mark, and he died so young. But it seemed like his mark was left more on the industry than, let's say, on moviegoers. I mean, what's wonderful is you're int- hopefully introducing, as maybe the Turner Classic Movie Channel has Ernst Lubitsch to a large larger audience potentially anyway yeah you know because he just never had the maybe it's just the sheer amount of years i don't know well it, it, back in his day he was almost a household name as much okay. as any director was there okay. wasn't as much awareness but there were a few people like say hitchcock and capra whose names became pretty well known to the public and it partly had to do with how good a self-publicist you were and those yeah. guys were great at that but lubitsch was known to the public his name was sort of a brand and uh they kind of knew that it stood for sophisticated comedy, and he, he really created like, the like romantic Noel comedy Coward. genre. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Claude Colbert, who I interviewed, said that before uh, it happened one night, the Capra made in 1934, they called it high comedy. They didn't call it romantic comedy. There was a, that term wasn't being used that much, but Lubitsch created the earliest examples of what we now consider the romantic comedy in its classic form. It, there was a film called The Marriage Circle in 1924, which is a wonderful silent film. Extremely sophisticated story of uh, 
uh, a couple and their marital problems and uh, very funny and it was ver- tremendously influential on all kinds of directors, Hitchcock and Douglas Sirk and other directors said they learned so much Michael Powell said he got into the industry because of that film and yeah, he had a tremendous effect on other directors but the public knew who Lubitsch okay. was and they loved, they loved his films and he also helped create the musical before him musicals were pretty much um, reviews where uh, the people would sing and dance on the stage and then there'd be a right. story going on but he integrated song and dance and music in ah. um, the love parade in 1949 he wasn't the only one there was um, King Peter did Hallelujah that year and Mamoulian did applause but Lubitsch made a string of musicals that really defined the musical genre and, and, and the public was tremendously pleased and uh, uh, you know, a lot of directors would copy these things and imitate them. So they knew who Lubitsch was. I think he became kind of forgotten over the years. Um, it was hard to see his films, too, and that was one of the reasons I wrote this book. I mean, I usually write a book because I'm bothered by some kind of injustice or oversight, and I want to correct it. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, and so with Lubitsch, I felt he's been kind of ignored. You don't hear about him in film schools very much, and people aren't writing much about him. There aren't very many books about him compared to, say, Hitchcock. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the nice things about doing the book, How Did Lubitsch Do It, is a lot of people have come out of the closet, so to speak, as Lubitsch fans or come up to me or send me emails or whatever and say, oh my God, I'm such a Lubitsch fan and I'm so thrilled you wrote this book. And Lubitsch's daughter, Nicola, who I've gotten to know well, she's a wonderful, uh, very terrific lady. Mm-hmm. She said, this is the book I've been waiting for all my life. She was so thrilled that somebody wrote a book like this, really appreciating her father and going into detail. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a long book because he had a long, rich career. And so I, I tried to see all these films and, um, he made 72 films, of which 49 survive in whole or in part, and that's a pretty good survival record for somebody from his from era, because a lot of silent films have been lost, but, sure. um, you know, some, some films I'd love to see have been lost, but other ones keep turning up, you know, and um, some have been restored recently, the Museum of Modern Art restored Rosita and Forbidden Paradise, which were only available in really awful prints for a long time, and a lot of his... Um, Early American films are hard to see even now. A lot of his films have never been released on DVD or Blu-ray or VHS in this country. And there, some of the German films that are terrific have never been released in America, except they pop up on YouTube, for example. There's one called Cole Hiesel's Daughters, which I would recommend people look up. Mm-hmm. It's a very hilarious sex farce made in Germany in 1920. It's just wonderful. Never released in America. They thought, I guess, it was too German, but it's just funny. It's a wonderful tour de force with uh, Henny Porton, who is a famous German actress, playing a double role. She's great. Um, but a lot of these films, you know, when I started uh, in the 60s, I saw Trouble in Paradise. It was the first Wibbage film I saw, and I thought, I've just seen this guy's masterpiece because I thought, yeah. How could anybody top this? And I actually still feel that because I've seen everything else um, uh, since then, but I still think it's his perfect film. It's his best film, but he, he made a number of other terrific films. And uh, But I wanted to see them in a selfish way, too. I, I just wanted an excuse to go to Europe and see these films. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you do a book, you... Um, I mean, I did this one on my own and then sold it to Columbia University Press later, but so I was kind of self-financing this, but um, I went to Europe three times, went to Germany twice, and Switzerland once. Uh, they actually flew me over there to curate a Lubitsch retrospective at the um, Locarno Film Festival in, 19, mm-hmm. in 2010, and that was great because they got the best prints from all over Europe, and in some cases America, so I got to see all the films in 35 millimeter the best prints we could get, which was fabulous, and I introduced a lot of them, and and Nikola Lubitsch came over there, and I got Mm -hmm. to meet her, and, uh, you know, and then collectors send me copies of films that are hard to get, and, uh, because when you do a book, you have to see the films over and over again, you can't just see them once, you know? Of course, right, yeah. So, uh, that's, that's been, you know, a dream come true for me to see all these films and to share my enthusiasm and hope that other people will get inspired. And I'm very happy that some people write me and say, you know, since I got your book, I've been inspired to have a Lubitsch Festival and I'm watching more and more on YouTube or buying DVDs. Or, and then, as you say, uh, TCM shows some um, filmstruck before they went to Funk Chat 13 Lubitsch films. It's a shame 
that, that went away. But Criterion is coming back with a new streaming channel, and they have a number of Lubitsch films. Oh, well, I was going to say, Warner Brothers is going to also have a streaming platform, and I'm sure all well, that TCM, because they, they kind of bifurcated... I mean, they were kind of paired up, which might have been a slightly odd to some, might have thought of as an odd pairing, meaning TCM and Criterion, because they sort of have different brands in a way, you know, not in a way, they do. Yeah. And now, because then when Warner Brothers got bought by at and I guess, they just, you know, they just decided they're going to do their own streaming platform. So I think we'll 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 get all the stuff on whatever that yeah, becomes. There are, and then, then that the Warner's Cri- has it. They've never released. I don't know why, for example, there's a Lubitsch film from the 20s called Three Women, which is not terrific, but it's it's a good silent film, and Warner's made it, and I don't know why it's never been released on DVD. Sounds like uh, a John, John Ford movie. What? Sounds like a uh, John Ford title. That's Seven Women and Three Outlaws, yeah. but anyway. Well, Robert Altman made a film called Three Women. Too. That's true, but but actually a, a better film that Warner's made in 1925, Lady Windermere's Fan, the Lubitsch film, which is a masterpiece. It's, it's not that so you can get that on one of those box sets of treasures from the American, what's it called, from the American Film Archives, and it's a beautiful, beautiful print, well preserved. But um, you have to buy it as part of the set. And uh, so this is Paris, is another film that Warner's made that uh, I had a. I have a tape of it that came out some years ago, but it was restored recently. We showed it at UCLA, and Nikola Lubitsch uh, came with me, and we introduced it. She'd never seen it, and she was delighted by it. It's a wow. very funny, charming, late silent film, but they haven't released that on DVD. The, uh, there was a terrific box that Kino Lorber, Kino Lorber put out a set of five uh, German films of Lubitsch and a documentary about Robert Fischer, and that's highly recommend it because he made some fantastic films in Germany uh, Oyster Princess and I Don't Want to Be a Man etc you know wonderful mm-hmm. films you know it's, you're reminding me and I'm, I guess I'm going to gear up as I start as I'm, I'm working my way through the Lubitsch book one thing I love doing is like I did with your John Ford book is to go back and revisit as well as finally see a lot of stuff and for somebody like John Ford you know, other than I imagine some of the some of the silent films, the early silent films that he made, so much is available, and it just becomes this fantastic experience to be reading such a thorough historic book about him and be able to see and watch the films again. Yeah, with Ford, there are about ninety five films that survived. He made one hundred and thirty seven as a director. John, a lot mm-hmm. of the silents are lost, unfortunately, but twenty five silents now exist. Uh, some are just Part. But when I started researching Ford in the 60s, I wrote a book called John Ford with Mike Wilmington, a critical yep. study, and there were only 12 Ford silence available then. So 13 have turned up in the last 50 years, uh, which how, is wonderful. And, and how recently have the, the last one or two shown up? Well, um, I think up. the last one was Upstream, which uh, there was a big find in New Zealand at the National Film Archive there. A UCLA scholar was down there, and uh, somebody at the archive said, we got a whole bunch of American films that some, some guy had. I think he was a projectionist, too. That was sort of the end of the road, Australia and New Zealand, for American films in those days, and they just wouldn't send them back because oh, it's it wasn't, expensive. Worth, wasn't yeah. worth shipping these nitrate films back, so they just threw them away. But this guy took them home, and he had... Um, Unique prints of uh, uh, films. There was a film that Hitchcock worked on called Woman to Woman. And a lot of American films have turned up. Some you can see online now, but Upstream was a silent Ford film uh, about theater people, which is quite charming. Mm-hmm. And that that was in good shape. And um, so they restored that and released it. And uh, But th- there, was, there was some short films of Ford. You know, Ford made a lot of shorts uh, as an actor and as a director, and also with his brother Francis. Francis. And Fran- a lot of Francis's work is lost, but they've been rediscovering some of his films too, which is important. But um, they found a film, for example, called The Bandit's Wager in uh, London, in which uh, Francis directed the film, but uh, John Ford plays a uh, supporting role, and it's it's the, one of the few films we have left in which Ford really acts. Um, he pops up in a couple things, but there, I, I discovered an OSS film. Ford made a lot of documentaries in World right. War II that nobody even knew existed. Um, so I went into the National Archives and I found dozens of Ford films. But he produced most of those, or was executive producer, and he didn't direct most of them as, in the way we think of directing. It's a film called uh, mm-hmm. Underground, which is an 80-minute 
film about how to be a spy. It's a training film, and he wow. plays a role. He has two scenes where he plays a uh, undercover spy who's in the uh, import export business. Is his, his front, and he's it's still he's used. Interviewing, he's interviewing a prospective spy, and he's, he's quite funny and quite good. Uh, you know, here's a little acting part. I actually heard about this from one of uh, his Navy colleagues who said he had seen this film, but couldn't remember it. I mentioned that in Searching for John Ford, but the film turned up, and you can see it now on. Uh, YouTube and actually I told um, uh, Netflix about it when they did the Time oh, right. Came Back series and they put Underground yep. on Netflix I believe uh, oh. because these are public domain films so part of the job of a film historian I always find, uh, think is to find films discover films I've discovered a few things like Wells' is early film The Hearts of Age which he made when he was 19 uh, kind of a, a, a avant-garde amateur strange little film but very inventive visually uh, I, I discovered that back in the 60s through a tip from my uh, film teacher Russell Merritt in Madison had lived in Greenwich Connecticut and he said they had a print at the local library and I went there and sure enough there was a 16 print because the guy who co-directed this film with Wells a man named William Vance had given this film to the library he was a he went on to make TV commercials so anyway um, uh this film popped up in the American Film Institute, preserved it, and now it's uh, you know it's public domain, so you can see it all over YouTube. And Wells was very upset that I discovered this because the myth that he fostered was that he 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 came like a virgin filmmaker to Citizen Kane. He had no knowledge of anything. He kept telling people this, and he was so great that he could just walk in. He had Greg Toland to show him how to do it, the great cinematographer and other mm -hmm. people, but. Yeah, he had never directed a film, allegedly, but I, you know, in my research, I turned up evidence that he had, had done other things. And then Too Much Johnson is another Wells film that he made in 1938. It was supposed to be part of a stage production, but he shot a lot of footage, and uh, that was uh, lost until um, a few years ago. It turned up in Italy in, in a warehouse. It was just a very strange uh, discovery. They were going to throw these cans of film out, and the guy who owned the warehouse knew a, a fellow who was with the uh, local film club, and he said, you want to look at these things? And he recognized what this film was. So this film suddenly turns up. You can see it online now. Uh, it's, it's the unedited work print that Wells didn't finish, and um, but it's fantastic to see it. It's in great shape, and it's extremely so you're saying you know? a film that Wells didn't finish it. Okay, that seems... that's. Well, he had problems with that film because uh, it was supposed to be, he had this idea of doing this old stage farce by yeah. William Gillette and interspersing film scenes that he shot around New York and supposed to take place in Cuba. So he, he had scenes in New York and scenes in Cuba and he it was in the style of slapstick comedy of Harold Lloyd and Max Sennett and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to... Um, I think I have four parts of 10 minutes each, something like that. And um, they ran into problems. He was doing too much at the time, and he, and he was getting overwhelmed. He was starting his radio show at the same time, and he was doing theater. Right. And, he was and, doing and multiple plays this, sometimes. Uh, he would be in multiple productions at the same time. Simultaneous. Yeah, and he was going to do this play in Connecticut to start and then bring it to New York. And Paramount, he didn't realize Paramount uh, had made a film of this play years before, and there was some they made some claim of ownership which clouded the whole thing of can you show this film and it later Paramount decided that they weren't going to claim they own the film so it doesn't matter but um, he also uh, at the theater where they're going to show it it wasn't configured to show motion picture films they were going to bring in projectors and stuff but it just uh, the technical aspects were not working so they had to abandon the project and Wells didn't have time to finish cutting it. But yeah, there are a lot of unfinished films in Wells' career. And yeah. that's, uh, but they all have their own story behind them, as I say. It's like yeah. uh, the line in Renoir's The Rules of the Game, the terrible thing about life is that everyone has his own reasons, has, has his reasons. And the terrible thing about each unfinished Wells film is that each one has his reasons for being unfinished. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. It's a particularly uh, unpleasant thing to a burden you know to carry that around because with somebody who is so ambitious and 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 brilliant to have that as their part of their legacy it just seems it's lousy you know but well um, it is and it isn't but you know the real 
reason, and there's a lot of misunderstandings surrounding that, so I'm glad we're bringing that up. Uh, mm-hmm. The other side of the wind, which came out last year that I'm in, uh, you know, he shot for six years and he spent uh, the last 15 years of his life trying to get this film finished. And it's not that he didn't try, he tried really uh-huh. hard, but he ran into all kinds of financial and legal problems and political problems that he often did things that were very unusual and uh, would get into get him into trouble for one reason or another. And also his sources of funding were usually unorthodox, often his own money. And then in this case, he needed more money and he, he made a mistake of getting money from the father and brother-in-law, which turned out not, not to be a smart idea. Right. And uh, for a, it's a long story, but um, he was making films on his own for the last 15 years of his life, literally home movies in the sense that he would shoot them mostly around his home or, you know, he would rent a studio in Hollywood. And he was working outside the system. And so if, if he'd been allowed to work in the system and if he had been inclined to do it more, um, he wouldn't have had those problems. But his career was uh, blighted by the problems that he ran into at RKO with uh, Citizen Kane and Magnificent Ambersons. And it's all true. RKO fired him. And I discovered they fired him on false pretenses when he was in South America making right. this documentary. They sent, in fact, they sent him to South America. It sounds like from what I've read, the writings of uh, Bogdanovich and others, that, that they actually sent him down there so they could take his film apart and take away all the control from, you know, away his control from that film. Is that well, true? That they actually... There, but, sorry. Yeah. It was, I know they sent it there for a film project, that, but but it seems like it was um, deceptive. But maybe that's not... Well, the yeah, there was a lot of deception about it. He was sent by the U.S. government because they wanted a uh, propaganda film for what became known as the good neighbor policy, trying to keep South America on our side in World War II, basically, and right. promote... Containment. Promote, uh, Right. Uh, you know, to combat the possibility that some governments might side with the fascists okay. and also to make sure they're on our side it was kind of a goodwill gesture and he really didn't want to do it and he had he was shooting Ambersons and he had to finish that in a hurry and get down to South America and he was supposed to cut Ambersons down there with Robert Wise and they didn't send Robert Wise uh, and so the, the studio took the film out of his hands but he was trying to make this very ambitious documentary and it mutated as his project tended to do from something um, kind of impersonal into something much more personal. He, he fell in love with Brazilian culture and was making a multifaceted film about uh, Brazilian culture and politics. And he was getting in trouble with the Brazilian government because he was filming in their slums around Rio. And they thought he was going to make this nice travelogue about how beautiful our country is. And then he was filming uh, the story of three impoverished fishermen who were protesting for their rights. And so the Brazilians were upset. And then in Hollywood, the RKO was getting upset because um, he was mingling black and white performers in the film. And they were worried that the production manager of the film was a racist who would send these racist emails back to the studio and alarm them. And uh, they were worried that they couldn't release the film in the South, for example, because back in those days you didn't mingle black and white people as friends or having fun. They were, you know, black people were always servants. So Wells was challenging the norms of both countries. As usual, he always he was a troublemaker and he would get in trouble with the establishment wherever he was. And so RKO... And, and Wells was sent there without a script and, and it told make up a script as you go along, make up this film because there was no preparation time. He had to get down to film the carnival. So, and then he was blamed uh, by our care. Well, you didn't have a script. You didn't know what you're doing. But, you know, a lot of documentary filmmakers do that. They go there and find out what's going on and, and construct the film. And he was doing that. And also... a lot of footage. And also... Yeah, but, but, yeah go ahead. Well, they claimed he was, they fired him because they claimed he was over budget. And I found the papers in the RKO files that proved that they actually lied to him. And I actually have a, two transcripts of telephone calls between RKO executives that they said, we're not telling Wells what the budget is in this film. It was a million two and he wasn't supposed to know that. They lied to him. And he thought it was around a million, but they, they never told him what the real budget was. And so when he was fired for going over budget, he was actually $447,000 under budget. I mean, this is shocking. Uh, this is the smoking gun of right. Wells' career. Yeah, right. He's, and and he's... then they spread the story, which people to this day keep repeating in books and articles, and, and people believe it, that he's this wastrel guy who was run out of Hollywood because he, he uh, spent so much money and couldn't finish films and you know, they took it out of his hands and he tried for years to get this film finished. That film was 
lost for a long time until it turned up unexpectedly at Paramount, um, uh, parts of it. And, and then a good documentary was made reconstructing parts of it. Um, but that was the big tragedy of his career in terms of Hollywood. That and the cutting of Ambersons, they chopped up Ambersons. I did a, a video interview for Criterion for their recent um, Blu-ray DVD edition of Ambersons, and I talk about all this, what they did to Ambersons and, and how they fired him. And um, they spread the story that he couldn't work with him, and he got a few Hollywood directing jobs after that, but he was kind of uh, under a lot of constraints and sort of genre films, except he made Macbeth for Republic, which was quite a remarkable film. Low-budget Macbeth, very avant-garde. But um, he was pretty unemployable as a director by then because his films were not making money. And the blacklist was starting. The HUAC hearings had just begun, and he left America in a big hurry right at that time because he would have been blacklisted, and I believe oh, he was blacklisted. He's in Red Panels, which is the book of it's the Bible of the blacklist. If you were in there, you were blacklisted, and you had to clear yourself in some way to get off it. So he spent from 1947 to 56 almost all of that time in uh, Europe and making films in Europe, and he became an independent filmmaker. But not well. He, he didn't have any option really, but he. Um, uh, part of my thesis in my book, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, The Portrait of an Independent Career, which I borrowed from a, a colleague of Douglas Gomery, is that Welles was always an independent filmmaker by nature, and he briefly had the resources of a major studio. But he thought and he worked like an independent. Right. And so he winds up being an independent filmmaker in Europe, scrambling to make films, and then he comes back to America to make Touch of Evil, and he was thrilled that a studio would invite him back. It was a fluke, and he made this wonderful oh film, and God. then they fired him. No, they were so angry the at him. Away yeah, they it were was too strange for them. Yeah, they were mortified by the the results. And, uh, a great film, but they so far ahead of his time. He was tra so traumatized; he never wanted to work for the studios again. And yeah. you know, he was really—they didn't want to hire him either. So he was making independent films uh, in Europe right. and America on his own and I, I think he should be praised for that and not and not uh, mocked like a lot of people do but when you do that sometimes you don't finish the films or you have a lot of problems with them well your narrative yeah it's, it would take a lot of a lot of work to get your narrative to reverse that other narrative that's been out there you know but it, you're right it sounds like the very thing that produced the same sort of talent and brain that produced Orson Welles' first major success was also his undoing because his outsized ego and independent streak, directorial, well, what was it called? I mean, he was given... Well, he had Final Cut. Final Cut, right? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a myth. He claimed a complete carte blanche. So okay. Came, uh, nobody, uh, the only person who's really ever had that in Hollywood is Charlie Chaplin because he owned his own studio. He was right. the star and the director and he paid for his own films. But Wells had as close to that as you can get in the system back then. Okay. But RKO had certain rights that they could cut the film for censorship or for foreign distribution. And, and uh, they, they actually did, um, the film ran into, into some problems with, uh, well, of course, the Hearst organization attacked the film. And uh, so the studios got worried about it and tried to destroy Kane. They were going to try to buy the film from RKO and, and burn it. And Wells talked him into uh, releasing it. And Robert Wise, who edited the film, told me he was there and he said it was Wells' greatest performance. They showed the film in a screening room at the Radio City Music Hall to the, the heads of the corporations that owned the studios and their lawyers. And Wells gave this speech. He said it was the greatest performance of his life. That he, he gave this eloquent speech about the world is fighting fascism and and uh, we're, we're defending freedom of speech and freedom of thought, and, uh, and this is a battle for freedom of speech, and it's against dictatorship. And you know, he, he moved them so much that they, they agreed to release the film, but they, they, they forced him to make some cuts of a few things that worried them. For example, there was um, an allegation that Hearst uh, helped inspire the assassination of President McKinley with inflammatory editorials, and, and the film implied that, and so they... Robert Wise said he spent five weeks making changes in Kane, which people don't realize. And, and in the film, there's a very sketchy allusion to that, but they, they tone that down and other things like that. But um, Kane was audacious. When you say he had a big ego, well, yeah, most most directors do. But sure. um, 
part of it is the audacity of this guy, and I think that's one reason I was attracted to him in the first place as a young guy. Um, the 24-year-old guy attacking William Randolph first, making this very daring political expose, very ambitious film artistically that kind of rewrote the textbook on how to make films that that's what got him in trouble. I, a lot stems from that in his career troubles when you take on the most powerful media baron in the country. Right. And uh, the studios didn't like that at all. And RKO, there, there, there were people there who just never liked him and never wanted him to be hired in the first place. And they almost destroyed him over that. And they almost destroyed this film that a lot of people think is the greatest film ever made. You know, literally burn this film. Could you imagine if that had happened? So um, that that was kind of the, the inciting incident, as, as they call it in screenwriting, that triggered a lot of other yeah. things that happened in his career. No, absolutely. 